is in our midst. Today on Sunday, November 12th, we commemorate the eighth Sunday of Luke, as well as St. John the Merciful, Patriarch of Alexandria, St. Nilus, the ascetic of Sinai, St. Leondos, Pipi, Patriarch of Constantinople, and St. Martin, the Bishop of Tours. Regarding St. John the Merciful, Patriarch of Alexandria, St. John was born in the year 555 on the island of Cyprus in the city of Amathus. His father, Epiphanius, was a ruler of Cyprus. This saint was consecrated Archbishop of Alexandria in 608. A man of exemplary uprightness, in his zeal for orthodoxy, he strove mightily for the fight against many heresies among the Christians in Egypt. But above all, he was famous for his singular generosity, humility, and sympathy towards all, especially the poor. His mercy was so great that the report of it reached the Persian invaders of Jerusalem, who desired to see him because of it. St. John reposed in the year 619 at the age of 64. In your patience you have won your reward, O righteous Father. You did persevere unceasingly in prayer. You did love the poor, and did provide for them in all things. Wherefore, intercede with Christ our God, O blessed John the almsgiver, that our souls be saved. Your riches and wealth did you disperse unto the poor. You now have received the heavens' riches in return. For this cause, O all wise John, we honor you with our songs of praise as we keep your memorial, O namesake of almsgiving and of mercy. St. Martin, the great luminary of Gaul, was the son of pagan parents. When he was still quite young, he became a catechumen. At the age of 22, he received holy baptism. When he undertook the labors of a monk and was afterwards consecrated bishop of Tours, renowned as an ascetic and wonder worker, a faithful shepherd of Christ's flock, he converted many both from paganism and heresy, cast out demons and raised the dead. And while undertaking all the apostolic burdens of a bishop, he never ceased to be a simple monk and a man of prayer. His monastery became a center of monasticism not only for Gaul, but of all of Western Europe. A widely celebrated incident of his life took place when he was still a catechumen, fulfilling his military service. Seeing an ill-clad beggar asking alms at the gate of the city of Amiens and being overlooked by passers-by, St. Martin, having nothing else to give, rent his military cloak in two with his sword and gave half to the beggar, so that he might cover himself in the cold. That night, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him, clothed with the half of the cloak he had given to the beggar. St. Martin's cloak, Capella in Latin, was kept in a sanctuary which came to be called Capella, from which the word chapel is derived. And they under whose care it was kept were called Capellini, from which chaplain is derived. St. Martin reposed in peace in the year 397. In signs and in miracles, you were renowned throughout Gaul, by grace and adoption, now you are a light for the world, O Martin, most blessed of God. Alms deed and compassion filled your life with splendor. Teaching and wise counsel were your riches and treasures, which you do dispense freely unto all them that honor you. As a devoted man of God, you did proclaim his mysteries, and as a seer of the Trinity, you did shed your blessings on the Occident. By your prayers and entreaties, O adornment of tours and glory of all the church, preserve us, O St. Martin, and save us all who praise your memory. Regarding St. Nilus, the ascetic of Sinai, St. Nilus, who had Constantinople as his homeland, was a disciple of St. John Chrysostom. He had formerly been an eparch of the city, then became an ascetic on Mount Sinai. He wrote epistles and various ascetical works and reposed about the year 451. With rivers of your tears you have made the barren desert fertile. Through sighs of sorrow from deep within you, your labors have borne fruit a hundredfold. By your miracles you have become a light shining upon the world. O Nilus, our Father, pray to Christ our God to save our souls. By your unsleeping prayer, O Father Nihilus, blessed, the God, blessed of God, you did most keenly cut away all material that enkindleth the revolts of the body's passions, and since you possess boldness with the Lord of all, from all dangers that can be, you deliver us, so that we may cry to you, Rejoice, O Universal Father. From St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, Brethren, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So when we are stewards of our parishes, of our metropolis, of the archdiocese, we should not be thinking to ourselves, oh, I don't know, am I being forced? I should No, we should be giving cheerfully. Say to ourselves, I'm going to do this. This is good. And the reality is when we give, we also reap a great deal. The more we give unto God, the more he gives us back. 
And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that you may always have enough of everything and may provide an abundance for every good work. As it is written, He scatters abroad, He gives to the poor, His righteousness endures forever, meaning God does not cease to give us of His heavenly gifts. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your resources and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for great generosity. Your us will produce thanksgiving to God. Now, one might look at this as almost a wealth theology to say, well, if I give $10 to a poor person, I'm going to receive $100 back or $1,000 back. You're giving a hundredfold. Sometimes this happens. Not always. But what this is really talking about is when I give of my spirit, when I give of me to another person, God looks upon that, blesses that, and abounds in that so that the spiritual gifts that I am growing grow even more. And with these, I can actually do good for the world, even more than financial good could. From the Gospel according to St. Luke, At that time a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, You have answered right. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed leaving him half dead. Now, this is an allegory because Jerusalem is high. It's, it's a mountainous area above sea level, whereas Jericho is the lowest city on earth. It's one of the oldest cities on earth. It's right next to the mountain of temptation. So basically, Jericho is analogous to hell. Jerusalem is analogous to heaven. So this man is going from heavenly area to hell. So he's on his way to descending into hell. And on his way there, he is attacked by robbers. And these robbers, of course, represent demons, that they leave him half dead. He's wounded. He's not able to move. And so this is a wounded individual. He has trauma. And this is something that all of us can relate to. All of us have traumatic experiences in our life. All of us have been spiritually bereft of good things. And so it is necessary for someone to save us, to help us. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, there are some that write this because the man would have thought, the priest might have thought he was dead, and it's defiling to touch the dead. But either way, he should have gone to check. A priest is supposed to take care of people, not abandon them. But likewise, a Levite, when he came by to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. But once again, his countrymen abandoned him. They did not go to him. They left him. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Now, a Samaritan is an enemy. Uh, the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. Uh, they were like the, likely to spit on each other. Like, if a Samaritan had seen a Jew, most likely he would have said, Good, it's good that you suffer. I hope you're dead. And like was a Jew to a Samaritan at those times. And this is the point that Jesus is making. And especially during these dark times, this is something we should all take in. That this enemy came and had compassion and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Now, these oil and wine, because obviously Jesus Christ is the Good Samaritan. He is the enemy, the rejected one, who has come to have compassion. The oil represents Ephelion. The wine represents the Eucharist. These things are the healing properties that bind the wounds and help this person. Then he set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn. This inn is the church, the Ark of Salvation, the Divine Hospital, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. So this represents that Christ is going to come back, the second coming of Christ. Two denarii, some posit that as uh, the Old and the New Testament. Others look at it as the two natures of Christ, the, um, the epistle uh, and the gospel. But the duality here is important, that these are the two things within the church that are going to help this person. Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed mercy on him. 
Jesus said, go and do likewise. We are called to love our enemies. This is crazy to the world. Everyone teaches us that you should hate your enemy, kill your enemy, see them driven before you. Even Confucius, who revitalized China, brought in a thousand years of prosperity for them. When asked, should you forgive and love your neighbors? He said, no, they'll take advantage of you. Christ is introducing something that is very hard for us as Christians, but it's quintessential to who we are. We are supposed to love our enemies. For we, in killing Jesus Christ, proved ourselves to be his enemy. And yet he died for us. He loved us. And what he wants for us to do the same, to have that same self-sacrificial love that he had for us. I hope that you've enjoyed today's spiritual calisthenics. Have a blessed and wonderful day.